they, you know, they did. So we got to see them in DC. We were at, we were at the North Carolina and the Yukon game. Awesome. Wow. Fun. Then we had to ride home on the, the subway with all the George Mason guys. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> literally the line to and through George Mason campus back. And you were the only guys that were UConn on there? Yeah. And like my college, like, professor was on the train for some reason like and he was even ripping me i was like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> that's funny all right looks like we're live again all right welcome back everybody hope everyone had a good lunch we were in the middle of the parks and rec presentation so tom i'll turn it back over to you okay Hold on a second. Oh. All right. This is where we left off with the uh, golf clubhouse repairs. Um, I think we started to, to talk about it, but I didn't hear any questions about the two-year plan. Did anyone have any other questions about that? If we don't acknowledge it, we'll pretend like we didn't hear it next year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, just a couple of photos to illustrate, you know, the, the wear on the, on the bathrooms and the doors. Um, we actually have some, some doors that are, you know, the, the things have shifted. The, some of the doors are uneven. Um, the hardware is literally falling apart at this point. Um, the things we're working on, on repairing, and obviously we're not going to let anything <laughs> um, fail. But, you know, an overhaul, overhaul of the whole building is, is at hand. Um, so again, looking at funding plans uh, with the park entrance signs, we're um, year two of a five-year plan to do all of the, the major parks and um, open space, uh, prime open space areas uh, signage. Um, we, you started funding this last year. Um, in this, this spring, early summer, you're going to see new signs outside Simsbury Farms and a new sign uh, for the new park at, by the Flower Bridge there, Hop Brick Landing. Um, up next... Uh, in, in this, if you fund this year, you'll see new signs at Memorial Park, Onion Mountain Park, and uh, probably Weetog Park as well. Um, the Simsbury Farm sign costs a little bit more. It's a little bit larger. So we estimate two signs this year than the regular park signs. We might be able to get two or three uh, per year after that. Um, we're actually working with our vendor right now to go into production for, the, for those two signs you've already funded. Um, Again, this will get this will kind of give uniformity at all of the parks. Uh, you'll know what's what. Um, a lot of those uh, entrance signs that are in the ground right now, the posts are rotting. The wood material has rotted. Orlando's guys have, you know, they put lipstick on a pig a couple of years ago with a coat of with a coat of paint, um, but they've had to kind of glue almost glue some of those signs back together. Um, so they are in need of replacement. For a second time, I was about to say, what's wrong with the picture that we're looking at? But then oh, I got to find print. This is kind of the template moving forward. This, was, this is pretty when, nice. Yeah, when town the town forest was renovated a couple of years ago, this was the sign that went in. So this is kind of the scheme going forward. You'll see uh, kind of uniform signs looking like this at all the new parks <laughs> and all the outside all the parks. I'm sorry. And, and moving forward here, parks facilities maintenance uh, software. I alluded to this earlier um, during uh, the initial present part of the presentation. What we're hoping to do, and again, this is part of the creating awareness about parks and streamlining things. Um, we don't have any software right now that, that the guys can use out in the field. Um, you know, when they're doing their facility inspections or out there out there mowing and they see something, we, we look at this as a more efficient way um, for our, not only our staff, but the public to get to us with any issues that they may see, um, whether it's a broken swing on a playground or a, or a leaking faucet along the trail. Um, something in the dog park or something that may happen on a Sunday out at the field where maybe a bench breaks or something. This will allow us, once they, they can take a picture of it right there and basically it'll, it'll go to Orlando or myself um, to note that there's a, a broken piece of equipment out there. We probably would get an alert on our phones about it. Um, and so if it needs to be taken offline right away, if it's a, you know, if it's kind of a dangerous thing, we can get that staff out there to do that, uh, but also get the wheels in, in motion to get things fixed uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and, it, and I think it shows our, our residents that we really care um, to provide these safe opportunities for them. Um, again, the software will generate work orders. 
uh, improve record keeping. It would give us preventive, it would give us maintenance reminders, um, you know, when, when, when a certain parcel is due for an inspection, uh, when we last did something there. Um, so this is something we'd hope you'd fund. Orlando and I had a, uh, a presentation. I've seen it at trade shows for a couple of years. We went through a, uh, a presentation by a, a vendor who does this type of thing last spring. It was very informative and, and kind of really um, made us think about how we can do things better and, and how this will, will help us do things better. Um, Orlando, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, you know, what, what I'm going to like about this program is that it's going to allow us to track man hours. You know, where are we spending a good amount of our hours throughout the week, month, and year? So it help us, it's going to help us just create better work orders for, for those areas that are our problem areas that we're kind of spending time on and what do we need to do to improve man hours at those areas. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to is, is tracking at staff hours at these different locations around town. That's great. This is cool. Is this something that public works could leverage? Yeah, some of the some of the systems that are out there, yes, there it's not just a park thing. There, it's a um, it could be a city citywide uh, or municipality wide program. Mm -hmm. um, there are, I mean, there's a lot of different options out there. I, I, I don't know what um, what program Public Works is doing that. If Tom's on the phone. Um, he can kind of chime in here, but I'm not sure exactly what they're using. We we took a quick look at something they had a few years ago, but it doesn't quite meet the needs of the. It's not fully robust to the to the extent that we would like it to be. Um, I don't know what the name of it is. Uh, we, we we're using a system through our GIS vendor, um, and we're using it both for the highway department and for the buildings and grounds department. Uh, somewhat of a customized platform. It was it's not all the bells and whistles we would like. We do have it open to the public right now. Um, but I think there would certainly be some advantages to making sure that whatever system um, both departments are using at a bare minimum communicates with each other. So, because so many times somebody who's making a club, making an identification of an area in town that needs some service. Yeah. Uh, they don't know whether that falls under parks and rec or public works. So that may just help with, with uh, where that, that uh, communication would, would go. Exactly. Today they post a picture on Facebook and that doesn't do a lot of good unless you guys know about it. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yep. So help me out. So this is, this is potential software to help us um, more efficiently deliver the services that we do, Tom. Is that what it's? it's yeah. So, so for, for even future budget requests, I mean, like Orlando mentioned, um, it'll, you know, that we have a login system here when a guy gets to a field, he'll log, you know, what is it, what's the job you're doing? How long does it take? From that standpoint, you know, I see efficiencies there, but I think from um, a, a, from a maintenance and tracking standpoint, everything would be pouring into the same place. When when we've fixed a piece of equipment, we'll we'll have a note when we fixed it. If it needs, if it fails sooner than it should, should um, maybe there's a warranty. You know, maybe it checks warranties, that kind of thing. But I think you know we have this process now where it got, maybe somebody sees something out in the field, uh, maybe a customer sees it and calls in, and then Orlando's you know filtering that out to his his people. I think we, we can find a lot of efficiencies there to get things fixed quicker, um, have, a, have tracking it along the way. You know, it'll every morning when he'd log into the system, okay, it kind of shows you where um, something's been reported is broken. It's you know, maybe the piece of equipment's been ordered, uh, staff has been sent out or whatever. The it'll get, kind of give you a status update as to where you are in that repair sequence, but also popping up uh, preventive or inspection reminders as needed. You know, when you set the one, the service we went through last spring, we would set up each of our facilities, uh, what amenities are there, uh, what the general inspection form should look like. Um, and then they're using that software to do the inspection when they're out there. It's, it's catered to what, what amenities are at that facility. Um, and then you schedule, you tell it when you want the reminders sent to you as far as, okay, it's this playground's due for an inspection every three months or whatever. I mean, it pops up with those reminders um, and potentially also when a st when staff members are out there, when they're when they're saying, OK, I'm at Curtis Park, it gives them a reminder to inspect benches or uh, kiosks or the portalettes or anything like that. You, do, you not, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And the important part about the software, too, is, is that the users of our facilities are going to be able to immediately, instantly text us or email us with potential issues at, let's say, a playground area where typically we need to get to the repairing a swing or a piece of equipment 
ASAP and not have to wait two or three days before we get to it. So you could, you're reducing the potential or possibility someone getting hurt, injured uh, you know, with a piece of equipment. So I think our response time to problem areas will be a lot quicker because uh, we're going to know about the problem probably instantly. Sir, um, as far as, as what do you think from an efficiency standpoint? Are we talking about meaningful or are we not, we're not sure? What, what's your ballpark there? As far as number of dollars saved or man hours saved? Yeah, man hours. It's hard to say because we haven't used this. We haven't used this type of system before. But I, I would, I think we'd see a significant um, streamlining of our operation. Uh, right now, everything's done. Everything in the parks department is done on paper. Orlando, am I incorrect in that? No, no that's correct. You know, typically right now, I typically get in about an hour before everyone else, just to get the work order system in place for that day. Uh, so this is going to help me, you know, to do a lot of stuff either from from home if I have to, or or uh, the guys can or throughout the day when the guys get back to me what they've completed for for projects for that day. So it, it's just going to help just produce quicker work orders, more accurate accurate uh, record keeping for for parks and equipment uh, going forward. Oh, uh, Eric, opportunity here. Okay, thanks, guys. Yep, Mike. It, uh, yeah, Orlando and Tom, um, we're actually using a, a laptop or tablet system now that both has uh, uh, GPS on it and uh, the capability for cameras and to write notes. Um, I would really encourage you to have your system at least upgradable to be able to do that. We're finding a lot of efficiencies with being able to take a picture of the problem and it, it automatically, at least our system automatically goes back to specific people. So my trucks are out on the road at four in the morning. They send in this thing that shows up at sales. When they turn on their computer, it's there waiting for them. So we don't have to wait for a phone call or a message to get uh, passed along. Uh, just make sure your system is able to, to do that. We can even put geofences around things. Um, and track the time on site, to be it at a field cutting the grass, in your case, or uh, any of that stuff. Yeah, Mike, I appreciate that. Yeah, this, the the one system we previewed last year did have the ability for the guys uh, when they were on site, if they were doing an inspection or they were just there to mow, if they saw something um, that they couldn't fix on site, they could take a picture of it and report it back to Orlando. You know, it would go it feed right back to the department head or the foreman um, to get it taken care of. Great. That sounds good. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Yeah, if I could just quickly jump into <clears throat> this particular project I'm really excited about. I know you guys know that I'm really big on efficiency and process improvements as well as, you know, customer service. And this system will help with all of that. Um, and, you know, I've worked with a couple of similar systems in the past and it's really great. I mean, you can get pretty sophisticated with your work order um, routing system, for example, where you can set up standards oftentimes within the system that, you know, within X amount of days, these types of, you know, requests that we might get from, say, somebody who is out on a trail and, you know, sends us a picture through their app. And again, it's, it will automatically route to people. You can set timeframes. You can set reminders. Um, if, if, you know, something isn't completed within a time frame, it can help with automated responses to customers when they have submitted, um, you know, something to us that needs work on. Um, and it's really nice, I think, for a member of the public. Let's say they're out, you know, on a, on a Saturday, Saturday at Rotary Park and they notice something's broken on the playground. They can just, you know, take a photo, upload it on the app and, and you know, there, it's, it's done. And, you know, how much better for us to hear about it that way. So first thing, you know, when we come in on Monday morning, we can get on it and deal with it as opposed to, you know, now it's right. A lot of times people don't know what to do. So they just maybe post and share on social media and, and we don't hear about it in a prompt way. So again, really excited about this project. I think it's going to help um, from a customer service standpoint. It's going to help us, you know, manage our workload a lot better. And I think be more responsive and, and get things done more timely. Um, and it's, it's exciting. Um, What's also great about this, um, we did have some savings from our Parks and Open Space Master Plan um, project. So what we're proposing as a funding source, since this is related to our Parks and Open Space, would be to then take those project savings and allocate it for the acquisition of the software and the tablets um, that our folks would use in the field. 
Um, and again, I, I know another priority for you on your goals um, was to try and look into some sort of a volunteer open space ranger program. Again, this type of an app system would be fantastic for our open space rangers as they're out, they're walking the trails, they're you know going through the parcels. Um, this would just really help support that initiative as well. So I think there's a lot of really good uses from here and just very excited about it. Maria, I love that. And I can't wait to get my chainsaw out there. Um, it's one of the <laughs> we can take the help. <laughs> so I, I, got, I got to ask though, guys, um, and I'm sorry, but so it sounds like we have add to staff requests, but then this initiative is telling me we haven't fully quantified where our efficiencies and where our staff is fully deployed. And I'm concerned with, we're going to add to and then learn a lot here, and that will, would better inform our staffing decision is what I'm hearing from this project. Is that? You know, from, from my perspective, <clears throat> where I think- a lot about efficiencies, right? And data and quantification and everything else, and we all got really excited about it, and I agree. And if there's that much efficiencies in here, then I'm wondering what the staffing need really is once we implement it. Yeah, for me, I think it's going to be less about saving staff hours to a certain extent and more about being able to respond more quickly to things as we become aware of them in real time, um, where I think this is going to be really helpful, um, again, from a planning perspective is, again, more so, I think, as we get more sophisticated with that on the capital budgeting side, um, as well as, again, our, our staffing hours, because I think we'll have a better sense of you know, do we need to allocate more staff resources, say, to Memorial Park versus Terrafield Park or we talk Park versus Terrafield Park? I think for us to be able to quantify where we should be spending the hours um, versus right now, it's, it's as Orlando said, more paper based. So I don't know if it'll necessarily save so much staff time as opposed to make our work, you know, a little smarter and be able to be a more responsive and more real time. I got to push, though, because we all just use the word efficiency and efficiency means less staff time. So. I heard really excited about efficiencies versus, mm -hmm. so, it, so it, the, it, I, I just, I wanna, again, if, if it's on paper and everything else, I just, again, if we're spending a thousand hours a year on Memorial Park, but we only need to spend 900, is that a potential here? And I agree with you, we can redeploy staff, Maria, but if, if we're light somewhere and heavy somewhere else, but net we pick up hours, is that what I'm hearing here from an opportunity? I would say less so of that. And again, only because we're already in such a deficit position for staffing in this area. You know, we're down already two to three people. I don't think implementation of this software is going to pick up, pick up even, say, a full-time equivalent, if you will. Um, and since we're not really adding to, it's just trying to get back to where we were in terms of our staffing needs. Um, I, I don't think we would have, you know, efficiencies, efficiencies in that sense where we would have significant you know, enough savings where we would be able to like say cut back on staff or not add back staff. But I don't know, Orlando or Tom, if you feel differently about that. You know, actually what I was going to add in here is I think the what, what this really helps out is if we do get that funding for the facility make it, maintenance technician, this is actually making their job um, to better utilize that person. We have a number of facilities now where we're, we're kind of chasing our tail with things as they break. And, and this is going to improve that, that, I guess, the job of that person. Um, you know, we have Orlando right now. Orlando City is getting here a year. He's our park superintendent. He's getting in an hour early every morning to do work orders. That's not his, that's typically not his job. That should be something our foreman's doing. We're so short on staff all the time. Our foreman is out doing the work of our maintainers. Um, by adding that facility maintenance tech in here, we kind of set, start to set things back correctly um, so that, that that work order system becomes more efficient. We get the people who, do, who get people doing the job they're supposed to be doing. Orlando should be doing more um planning and rfps and uh following the projects and we're kind of you know he's working 50 60 hours a week um because we're so short staffed and he's doing the job that are you know splitting the job with our foreman and our foreman is splitting the job with the maintainers you no, know I, this I, puts I, us I, back I, in play. and I, I guess but i'm confused i thought this was going to make that so that orlando wouldn't have to do that as much i thought that it, was one of the benefits of this project it, it was certainly going to help but you still have somebody to fix these things yeah, and, and also, Sean, the, the, the work is, it is what it is. I mean, we, we don't forget, we, we've reduced some staff by about 30% in the last 10, 15 years. And our responsibilities have increased by about 30, 40%. So uh, a software program is not going to take away our workload. It's going to help, it's going to assist us with, with maintaining what we have. 
It's going to help us respond quicker to situations that potentially could become hazardous conditions. It's yeah, going to no, do more no. of that. that. That's how efficient we're, we're going to be working as a department. But we do have a, a, our workload over the last 15 years has increased by about 30, 40 percent. And our staff size has decreased. So the workload is still there, but it is going to help us be more, work more efficient in a way that, where we're going to get respond quicker to situations around town. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I guess the challenge we have, and it's it's an unfair question because I don't think there's an answer, is we went down in staff, we went up in work, but we don't know what the baseline was as to was the staffing level too much for the work in the past? Was it too little? Was it the right amount? I mean, I think we're, we're all talking about it like it was the perfect number. And I don't think we know that, right? And we've maintained the level of service um, for a decade plus. And the problem is, is that the new baseline? Were we inefficient in the past? You know, I, I don't know. Um, that that's what I struggle with here because you yeah, know what, what, it's hard to say is, we're restoring services after fifteen years, right? I, I get yeah, the what, argument, I get the premise, but God, what I consider that Sean is that yeah, the work is getting done, but is it getting done to our expectations? Okay, uh, is it, are they getting done to what the services should be getting done at the level? that is expected by, by, by our, our community. Yep. And the answer to that is no. I can't tell you how many times I'm driving home uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon and I see a park that we didn't get to mow because yep. of lack of staff. We didn't get to inspect the playground equipment because of a lack of staff. Those are areas that are crucial areas to this community and, and they, they, they count on having these facilities maintained at, at, a, at a high level. And we want to be able to produce those services. And now with how we're being staffed, we can't do that. Being honest, and I've been with the town for 32 years. Yeah, no, you and I, know I, can, I, I, I can only be honest with you by saying that that yeah, we're maintaining levels at a point, but uh, the levels should be maintained a little. Slow. I'm not happy with how the levels are being maintained. I can tell you that, and, I, and I'm not even a town resident, but I've been here for 32 years. I would rather see our level be slightly higher, and the community should get what they're paying for. And right now, they're not, and that's no, just my honest opinion. Orlando, you're as much of a member of this community as I do. Residency doesn't matter. So you uh I think more people know you than the rest of us on the board. So and that's uh thank you. appreciate that. Thank you. You've done, you've done great work. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Just, oh, Go sorry. Ahead. Oh, thanks. I was just gonna jump in. And so you may recall that, you know, very early on in my tenure, I had a sense that our park staff was really thin, but I was reluctant to make a recommendation until the completion of our parks and open space master plan. And I think that was really helpful because they did take a look at, you know, what we have under our purview and staffing levels and where staffing levels should be. And you may recall that they did identify in the master plan that they felt that we probably needed about two to three extra people just to really properly maintain what we have under our portfolio. So for me, that was really helpful in terms of quantifying what that that need was. And so it was after that recommendation was when we you know, first brought to you an actual staffing request last year, because without that sort of quantitative analysis, I was, it was more just a gut feeling, right? But I wanted us to be able to articulate that. And I'm really grateful to the master plan for helping us to identify what that need was. Sort of coincidentally, that need happens to be what I later learned was that staff, you know, the staff cuts that had unfortunately happened in the mid, mid 2000s. Um, but again, I'm very, very grateful we have the master plan analysis to help us understand like what that you know maximum staffing level would look like for for them. No, I agree. And I guess my point is we also increased the workload 40 percent. So arguably the staffing load wasn't right in the past. So we just need to, the terminology, right, is restoring of services. But if the master plan says, you know, it, it's all numbers to me. Right. And I, and I get it. And it's all the, all the perspective. I mean, um, it's it's challenging. So. The, the hard part here is 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 to, to give a comparison in in Tom Roy's world, right? He gave us a number on the roads, and there's a standard, right? And we, as a community, embarked on the previous um, we we embarked on a previous path where right time we were at you know in the 60s and 70s and some some 80s on our roads, right? And we intentionally went to 85. Um, is there the same, or is there anything that you can help me comprehend? Like, are we at a 50? Or are we at like a 90 from a park standpoint? We want to go to 100, you know, like where, where quantify it for me. Cause you know, we talk about the field didn't get mowed on Tuesday, but it got mowed on Wednesday and I'm sitting here going, who cares? Um, I don't have, but I don't have an appreciation for what that means in terms of service delivery. Whereas if a road's a 75, 
I know when I drive down it, 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 it feels like crap and it's not, it's, it's not a good thing, right? Or if it's at a 65, it's got massive potholes and there's car damage, et cetera. So is there a way to help quantify this for me? I mean, from a funding level, I, we could, I can certainly provide you with, well, give me some time. I can provide you with information as a, as far as a per acre staffing level. Is that what you're getting at? Or you're asking Orlando to grade where he feels we are right now? Yeah. Like if, if, if we wanted to maintain a level of service, if we wanted to maintain the level of service we are today, let's pretend that we snap the line and whatever it is today is the new baseline versus we want to get to a 20% improvement because to Orlando's point, the community expects more. I'm like, how do we, what does that mean? Like, where are we? If we benchmarked ourselves, are we at a 75% level where, you know, we're, we're average, you know, we're, we're barely passing or are we already in the eighties and nineties and we're, we're, but we want to push ourselves further. You know, Sean, it, it, that would depend on who you talk to and, and depending on services that we're doing. If you talk to, you know, you're at the uh, athletic department, at, say, say the uh, soccer team, sports teams, they might say that we're at a 70% uh, work capacity. You, you, you speak to a trail user uh, who's using the trails every single day, they might say we're at a 50% capacity. They might, they might want to see more services at that location. You speak to our pool people, they might say, yeah, we need to spend probably, uh, you know, 20% more time working on pools. So it depends. We, you know, we're, we're we're dealing with a lot of different groups in town, from from community community volunteers with with sports groups, swimming pool groups, tennis groups. So it, they all have the the view on how much time we should be spending at, at different facilities. But overall, to me, we're probably at a seventy percent uh, capacity. I'd like to see us at ninety ninety five, where we're not we're, we're we're maintaining and not responding to situations. It just seems like we're always pulling out fires. And, and when we should be probably maintaining our facilities and not putting out fires. And that's good perspective, Orlando. So it's it's very much reactionary. And again, no fault of anyone's, but reactionary. And again, what you're arguing is the proactive. And then to Tom's point earlier, better allocation of additional staff puts us at a, at a much higher level of service delivery very quickly. Is, is if, I, if I could kind of summarize what you guys are saying. I, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. We're our latest. What you guys said, reactionary and maintaining. We have we we are not at a level where we can do any preventive preventive maintenance at this point. That's that's where we're, we're I think we're really falling behind on, and so we're always playing catch up with things that, as they break and and that kind of thing. So yes, I think that's what you're saying is correct. And I'm not trying to give you guys a hard time here, right? But at the end of the day, you know, we always try to boil it down to numbers and everything else, and quantify it in percentages and. A lot of it's subjective, and I get that. And what what I think is an eighty five for a road, somebody might think is a hundred, and it's too much money or otherwise, you know. And and I appreciate that there's a lot of subjectivity in this space, but um, it just helps me frame the conversation as I think about how how we do this. So appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Oh, uh, good, good, great question, Sean. We appreciate it. Okay. Eric, uh, it's Mike again. I have a real quick question. Um, if you go with the that maintenance software. Do you think it's unrealistic to see a 5% increase just because you're going to be able to not be as reactionary? And, and I'm pulling that out of the air myself. Um, but I would think you would be able to not just send somebody to look to see what's there. They can do it as part of their normal course of business. But now you can have a person go out and do something at Curtis Park and Terrafield Park as opposed to then come back and then go back out again. Is that seem reasonable, Tom or Orlando? Yeah, yeah. Mike, that, that's, that's, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, go, Orlando, go ahead. Mike, that's correct. You know, there, there could be times that we could be at a park doing <clears throat> mowing or something or some repair work and not know of an issue because it was never reported. And we leave yeah. that park and and not know of an issue and, and have to go back again that same day to to repair an issue so yeah that would certainly uh, uh, help us with that situation absolutely great thank you okay um the next project on the list here is the uh, is a trailer. Um, it's one of Orlando's. Orlando, please talk about your equipment trailer. 
Yeah, I mean, really, it's not much to say with this. This is a 30-year-old trailer. Uh, we typically use this this trailer to haul equipment around town, different different parts of parks and open space areas. Uh, you know, it's 30 years old. You know, we, we make our equipment last as long as possible. But you get to the point when it's something's 30 years old that where the, where you get the uh, some fatigue going on with some metal or, or axles and, and things that we just can't no longer find parts for. Uh, but again, it, it's 30 year old piece of equipment that's used pretty much every single day to haul equipment around town. And and when you're hauling something uh, equipment on a trailer, you want to be sure that the, the the trailer is safe. It's not going to co- cause an issue for us down the road. Uh, but other than that, that's about it for that. Thank you. Additional, whoops, hold on. Additional projects, uh, Simsbury Meadows electrical repairs. And as you know, we did the fence last year um, at Simsbury Meadows. Everybody seems to love the fence. Uh, most people love the fence. The uh, When we move that fence a little bit further to the edge of the field, um, you see those uh, outlets that were spaced uh, along the old split rail fence. Um, those were put in when the, when the park was built. Uh, conduit in the ground has become, you know, PVC gets brittle when it's in the ground for a long time. Um, some of the wiring needs to be redone. So what we're going to plan to do is remove that, um, those outlets, push them back a little bit more toward the edge so they're not sticking out uh, where they become a trip hazard or a safety hazard for other events going on. Um, but that it's a minor renovation project to that electrical uh, system on the west side of the field. Um, and then we're hoping that you'll fund, uh, consider funding a five-year renovation of our irrigation systems at the various parks. Again, this was made, uh, mentioned to you in, in the Parks and Open Space Master Plan presentation. Uh, we have irrigation systems at almost every park. Uh, those irrigations play a big, irrigation systems play a big part in making those fields playable um, at those locations. Um, but like anything else, uh, when it's in the ground for an extended period of time, uh, the parts um, and piping becomes, um, ha- it reaches the end of its life. So what we're hoping to do is replace the irrigation system at the Memorial uh, Hardball Field. That's the one, the big field on the upper uh, part of the park. Um, and then over the coming years, we'll be re- replacing systems at the Meadows, uh, Curtis Park, uh, Weetog Park, and the Little League fields um, in additional years. Uh, again, this is similar to the conversation you've heard at the golf course. You can only leave this stuff in the ground so long before, you, before it fails. Um, and these systems are, repa- are nearing the end of their life. Any questions? Uh, just a quick question. So for, you know, for the baseball fields, we pay for all the irrigation and everything, right? Like those are our parks. And the, um, the same with Curtis Park. I don't know if, I can't remember if it's in the CNR um, or if it was in the Capitol. But, you know, there was a lot, there was a few items for Curtis Park. Um, parking. Do, do, pardon me? The parking area. At Curtis. Park. Yeah, the parking area, some lighting, I think. Um, do the do the clubs participate at all in the in these costs, or is it all on us? So, so they, it's a good question, Wendy. Like the the pavilion that's over at Curtis Park, that was a soccer club project. Um, the fencing, the uh, the big netting that you see along the road to keep balls from going in the road. That's yep. those are things that they those are th- another example of things they paid for. Um, last year, the coed soft or the year before, the coed softball league put a water fountain over a tariff bill. Um, they do, these groups do a lot of things like that, those type of capital projects. Um, something on the scope of a parking area or an irrigation system. Um, I think that's our infrastructure. Um, it's not an add-on, it's, it's a to maintain kind of thing. Um, so I think, you know, my opinion, and I'm not sure about about the, the boards, but those, that's part of our infrastructure that when we consider building that park or that um, amenity, we're taking care of it now. Okay. Just because there's there's quite a lot of items related to the specific sports and fields. So mm-hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Tom. Yes. My question um, may be similar to hers, but so it looks like in our plan, we're doing a lot of irrigation and not just at the fields. I think Hopbrook Park. That was installed last fall, yes. It was installed already. Yes. So what was the ask for this year for Hopbrook? For, for the water bill for that park, because we it wasn't something that was in last year's um, budget. So now you have an irrigation system. Now you have to pay for the water in that irrigation system. Okay. So my question is about what, what we are going to take on if we take on replacing all these irrigation systems. Is that something that you can negotiate so that we can get 
reasonable prices if we're going to be doing such a big project? Uh, on a year by year basis, if we're putting it out for, I've never, my experience is this is, these have all been done on a, on a, this, this would be a one and done project, you know, per field. Um, I don't know if Jeff or Tom has had experience doing a five year like replacement plan for some of these things. Um, or, I mean, I guess if you did it all in one year, yes, Jackie, then you, you probably could get, put it out to bid and get a better, get competitive pricing on that. Yeah. Otherwise, you're, if you're, there was you're putting it out to bid every year. Um, right. As you, as you go through it. If yeah, Tom, and if, it. if I can add to that real quickly, like the, this, you're looking at doing the, the main hardball field, the Legion field at Memorial. That's pretty much a standalone field. So that will be a, a project done by itself. But when we do the, the, the Little League fields, we can combine all five fields and do those at once. And there will be a, there will be a pretty substantial savings when we do all five Little League fields because they're in the same location. So that would be, there, there will be some savings there, correct? Okay. That's hey, Tom, uh, Jeff, Shay, uh, just want to make the point that uh, with a new system, you're going to uh, get some efficiencies on water right. use. So there will be savings on the water bills. When these be re get replaced with the new technology available for the controllers uh, for those systems. Yep. No, thank, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to get to that. And as well as the, the presentation you're going to hear from Aquarian, um, I believe it, you're in the next couple of meetings. Uh, with the new regulations going in place. As we replace these systems, they become more environmental friendly as well. The one quick thing, just if you, you're looking to gain an advantage of packaging it up into a larger contract, just be careful when you go above the 100,000, you're gonna be into prevailing wage. Good point. Yeah, and if um, you may have noticed as, um, in your CNR tab, you can see um, the various um, fields that we have proposed working on irrigation over a five-year period. And in totality, we're estimating that work to be about $390,000. And again, it's such, in totality, it's such a large amount. Again, when we're only working with 460 and 250 for the payback method um, that, you know, we were really sort of doing our best to say, okay, how can we break this up into you know, smaller chunks, you know, tackle what's the worst first and work work our way sort of backwards um, so we can just afford to get the work done. Because at 390, we're not going to be able to fund it with cash. And then when you look at our bonding needs, it's not going to happen. So that was sort of one of the, the strategic reasons that we looked at, you know, the project and did our best to try to sort of break it up in smaller chunks where we could pay essentially a little bit at a time on a cash basis to get the work done. I mean, ideally, of course, like if we had three, $390,000 to just be able to knock it out, that would be amazing. Um, but I just think with our current, um, sort of our current overall climate, um, we just weren't able to come up with that kind of money to be able to do the work all at once. But yes, in an ideal world, Jackie, that would be very, very nice to do. <laughs> Maria, you're bringing up a, a fantastic point, one that I was, I'm going to say 30 times today, right? But We've got a real tough decision on our on our hands here because we've invested this money in the past and and up until this year right on three hundred thousand for irrigation here fifty thousand for trucks there right all this stuff but with with the, the the massive nature of the school projects and the continuing large town needs I'm really struggling with where to. At my core, I believe in recreation. I believe it's a foundation of what we need to offer in this community. But I struggle with it ranks third, in my opinion, from schools and public safety slash town. And if we're committed all of our capital and our CNR projects to those first two buckets, I just I, I'm concerned with how we continue to pay for this stuff you know, given our constraints and, and given where we're going to put ourselves um, from a from a spent a debt load standpoint, you know, and it's, it's a larger conversation of we and back to that whole ba benchmarking, we want to provide 95%. But in the debt climate, we're going to be in and in the capital climate, we're going to be in can we only go to 70? I guess is is kind of what I'm my the point I'm making, if that makes sense to folks. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does, Sean. It's, and that's actually a really great segue for some of our conversation later this afternoon. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you'll you'll like some of the um, analysis that we finally were able to complete around quantifying our baseline 
um, smaller, you know, CNR needs as well as our capital needs under 500,000. Um, what we're currently contributing for cash pre prior to what we had been. Um, we've got some, I think, really good info and some um, graphs to help visualize that problem that you were just describing for this afternoon. We're really excited to share it. So yeah. thanks, thanks for bringing it up. Can I, can I just weigh in on top of what Sean said? Um, so this is like the elephant in the room. Um, so we have all these parks and recs and Dave Bush is on still, I believe. Um, so we have, I'm looking at the parks and rec plan and their priorities are all the current parks, but they also have the open space as a priority. So the elephant in the room is we have Meadowood on our plan for 2.x million dollars. And that would go to debt service over five to six years. And we have a massive amount of current parks and rec requests. If I, if I add up the bottom, it's like uh, CNR that's proposed over the next five years out of the general fund is about $3 million. Um, like, and if we can't have both, right, we can't do all of both it is a parks and rec. I mean, I know it's going to be, a, it's a policy call, but a parks and rec, you know, would you, you, do you, would you prefer, like, do you want to keep up the current parks and make them as best use best, um, you know, as good as they can be, or, you know, use a lot of that money for securing open space and letting some of these items fall off the list. It depends so I on just what. think it's, it's a hard question, at least for me, it's hard to grapple with. No, it's, it's a fair point, Wendy, but it depends on where the money comes from. If it comes from debt service, it's not the same pool. But if it does come from CNR and cash and other places, then it is, right? Well, I'm just thinking Meadowood's going to come from debt service in the next five years, right? It's going to go because it's going to be bonded. Maybe. Correct. We haven't decided yet. Uh, oh, okay. So let's say some of it. And then and and then we have these lists for the next five years out of the general fund for parks and rec. Right. right? Those, are, Which would hit, those are two different accounts is my point. Well, that, those will those general fund would hit the mill rate, but the debt service would also eventually hit the mill rate, right? Right. As we pay that as part of our... It's Correct. A, it's a chicken and an egg argument. You could say that if we just did Meadowwood, it doesn't actually change the mill rate because we already spend X on debt service and it fits within the current debt service confines. So assuming we spend six, five, six, seven on debt service, no, it doesn't change the mill rate. If we go to seven or eight, it's not going to be because of Meadowwood. It's going to be because of Latimer that we go to yeah. seven or eight on the debt service line. So it, it depends on what you say pushes us over. But in my opinion, the $25 million project pushes us over on debt service, not the $2 million project. But then again, if, if we use cash or CNR for Meadowwood, then your point is 100% right. It, it's potentially taking away from some of these. It depends on which pool of money we use. Well, that I, right. So I'm just saying, and, and then also I saw in the capital plan there, the $2.2 .2 million golf course next year, the irrigation, right? So mm -hmm. that's going to be a bonded item too. So I'm just saying in, in general, like from a parks and rec perspective, I guess you're going to say you want all of them, but is it is either a priority for the commission? So David Bush, for the commission, you have a unique and one-time opportunity as it relates to Meadowwood. And uh, that, in, in my opinion, that should not change our needs looking forward on our current uh, uh, you know, capital uh, requests. Uh, Meadowwood, although it somewhat falls into our bucket, Meadowwood is open space. Meadowwood is not just a park and rec function. And so right. to say that we have to bear, park and rec has to bear the brunt of that purchase, really, I don't think is, is the way to look at that project. It is a town-wide issue whether someone wants to acquire a property that large and available at, at really a very favorable price no different than when we purchased uh, the land uh, you know, bordering Ethel Walker was that was a town wide decision, not a park and rec decision. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if there's financially and again, like th where the money comes from and how we pay for it and how it hits the taxpayer. Can you I, know. It, Wendy, I, you, know, no, you know, I'm glad you brought this up. We should maybe start thinking about um, it you know, the future, right? And and what really is, what your question was, where is, is Sean's, everyone's point in this call is the things that we do today, what do they allow or don't allow us to do in the future? That's really, you know, 
one is the cost to the taxpayer today, the decision we made, but really what, what latitude, you know, we, 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 we might not even have a purpose for budget meetings in the future because there's nothing really to talk about, but you can't do anything. You could get into that position where you just say, you know, there's nothing to actually no projects to even consider because we can't. We have to be careful. Um, and Sean's point about, you know, sort of kind of what, where, what, which account or what pays for what we're talking about. And um, Dave, I, Dave that's, that's a really, I'm glad you said what you said about considering Meadowood through a broader lens rather than park and rec. That, I, I, I really, I hope that people hear that and, and that's going to continue to evolve in my mind as well. Um, and that I, you know, I, I, I agree. I don't necessarily want it to, to burden, um, you know, the, the, the weight that you guys are already carrying and the stewardship that you're responsible for going for it. So I think it should be somewhat more pliable. Um, but, the it, the you know but i think we do need to think about these small twenty five fifty thousand dollar projects honestly this is going to be probably this is going to be where the pnr folks are going to come at me with pitchforks and torches but the reality is to find the space we're talking about you know we're already we're already assuming today that we're going to replace a playscape at x field or x park in 2027, we haven't heard about it yet, but these, those are the kinds of places where I think the PNR folks need to really take a long and hard look at the difficult decisions we're all gonna have to collectively make. Um, you know, whether it's, because those are the little ones, right? That's the, we're strapped for cash, which is what I think Sean was trying to unbundle the conversation around really understanding what, how things are functionally paid for, where we have more latitude, or what's what's draining our immediate cash reserves, and these some of these smaller projects which are stacking up and they're backing up against each other, or is where we're draining ourselves and draining our cash. And so I think for the future boards and just state for the public now, we really got to think about these small projects. I'm not we got to replace a truck. A truck's got to be replaced. You can't have an efficiency through the savings of not replacing a truck. You can't offload a truck's responsibility or purpose or function to some other device you need that truck you can't go from two to one but a park i hate to say it you know a park playscape that park playscape may not get replaced there's another playscape that you can go play on is it in somebody's backyard i don't have a i don't have a playscape in my neighborhood's backyard unfortunately it's sad that i get in a car to go play someplace. That's kind of like the, you know, that's going against what I'm speaking to. But I think those are the kinds of hard decisions, you know, a, a splash pad at a, at a memorial pool or a memorial pool. Does that get sacrificed because it's, it's cash or it's big bonding? I don't know, but I, I want people to know these are conversations that we are going to have to have as, as stewards of this town. And they're not, it's not going to be comfortable. You know, and those are the types you have to have. Every one of these has a constituency. Right. right. And yeah. nobody, it's like, it's like the, what I point is like, we, we, we make a commitment, but it's not a, it's not a commitment at all costs. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I will not govern in that way. Right. Um, and I don't think every, it expects us to, we can't, and we can't say yes to every, it's, it's not possible at some point folks, because every constituency, but some people have to suffer, sacrifice, or change perspective. You know, that's the, the reality, you know. And unfortunately, we can't, you know, we want, it, we want to say yes to everybody. But we're going down a path that we're running out of yeses. We got we to conserve the yeses. Yeah, I, I agree. And Eric, I know we need to move on because we got a bunch of other budgets. But the only thing I would say is I think we're like, likely leading to, especially at least from my vantage point, is a request back to Culture Parks and Rec to prioritize some of this stuff because I I I feel like we're going to have to cut this year and for the next five years because the Board of Finance has specifically asked us to make a capital plan on both the the, the capital side and the the CNR side that actually fits um, and actually meaning it fits under a certain debt guideline and 
again, it's an exercise because everything that we cut would be shown down below, um, but I understand their point. So instead of leaving it to us, um, which we can do, and the Board of Finance says the same thing to us every year, they can do it or we can do it. But you know, do you want the sprinkler system at Simsbury Farms or do you want the playgrounds for kids? You know, you're going to have to start getting into that level of what's number one and what's number 10. And, you know, seven and 10 might not happen this year. And candidly, they might not happen ever um, is part of the challenge here. If one through six keeps beating out seven through 10, um, it's not a, it, it's in no means trying to be, to be negative or down, but that's the conversation that we're facing. And because the, the, the culture parks and rec side does um, have a, a, a large amount of capital needs. Um, I think that's what we're driving towards here, at least is how I see it. But again, more this afternoon or later this afternoon. Tom, was there any other additional information you were going to share or did that conclude your presentation? No, we're not done yet. <laughs> okay. We're getting there, <laughs> but I'm afraid to go further, I guess. Um, yeah, one second. There we go. Um, uh, I don't know. Seeing our projects, these last two, um, these are these are pro uh, the bunker rake and the golf utility vehicle. These are both funded through the golf course equipment fund. Um, so we have the money in place now to pay for these. It comes from the from the the surcharge on the greens fees of the golf course. But here you have a bunker rake. Uh, with, a lot of, with a lot of hours on it. It's used extensively every day of the golf season. Um, pretty self-explanatory. If, if you golf, it's your, you know, uh, shaping your sand traps. Um, any questions? No. And this is the utility vehicle that they're looking for. Again, this is moving uh, tools and personnel around the golf course. Uh, this vehicle is uh, 1991. Uh, it, it is way, way, way past its prime. It is currently inoperable, and it's something that they do need at the course. Uh, and once again, this, this, we already have the money in place to pay for this through the golf surcharge account. But I appreciate your consideration. Capital uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, the master plan noted that parking, um, not only at the Meadows, but at Curtis Park, were the, some of the highest priorities due to accessibility and safety of these parking lots. Um, this will this project the town did apply as you are aware a steep grant last year uh, that will help us improve the accessibility um, for those challenged individuals and not only from the parking area but once they get into the facility and I have a couple of pictures here that'll help illustrate that point. Um, this is obviously the parking area everybody's familiar with this time you know it's it's going to look like this next week with the warm weather um, coming and. Then the overview here, what I wanted to show you is, so in the lower right-hand side of the picture is where the accessible parking area typically is. Uh, the problem, you have you have a gravel parking lot um, and then you have stone worn stone dust paths throughout the facility. Um, or if you're in a wheelchair and you, you're able to make it through that, if you use a wheelchair and you're able to make it through the stone dust path and then you, you wanna sit on, into the grass turf, you're pushing the wheelchair through turf or trying to get that wheelchair through turf. Our hope is to pave, obviously the parking lot would be paved, but then you'd have a pa the paved paths through the facility and an additional paths through the inner rock wall, inner courtyard area uh, to imp improve the accessibility of the field um, to patrons. And, and additionally, when we have these large events on the field where this area will happen to capture, you know, vehicles on the field, things like the flea market, uh, chamber, the uh, September Fest events, we, our hope is that for when we have to load these vehicles up, they would stay on the paved path, one way in, one way out, uh, reducing the wear and tear on the fields, the running out of the fields. Um, you hear some efficiency with staff time. It takes a lot of time to get these fields playable after some of these large events when vehicles have been on them, because uh, you can't, obviously you can't predict the weather, but um, this is identified as a high need. Your The focus groups, your constituencies identify this as something that they want to see. Um, we do have a grant and I hope you'll consider funding it um, going forward. Maria, Jeff, anything you want to add to this? Mm. No, Tom, just that uh, we did go through a conceptual design process and estimate to make sure that the number was correct. Um, I think Tom's picture tells a story. You have material there, it's gravel, but it's holding water. What does that tell you? 
that tells you that we're probably going to have to replace a lot of the gravel with a, a more superior product that will, you know, let the facility last for the full life of the facility, 20, 25 years without touching it. So uh, just a little perspective. Guys, can I ask a, a, a misguided question? So we pave, Tom, what do we pave? 16 miles of roadway every year for a million six? Uh, 1.3 million, 10 miles of road. So this is a whole heck of a lot less than 10 miles of roadway. Why is it so much more on a, uh, on a cost basis? What's the difference here? Sean, I think, uh, go ahead, Tom. Significant site, site significant site engineering, right, Jeff? With the, well, because yeah, you the have, soil, the wetlands, everything's going to be. You have constraints. You have environmental constraints that don't yeah. allow you to fill that area. It's got to essentially be maintained at the grade it's at. Public works generally does not reconstruct roadways. They, you know, improve roadways. Yep. So this is more of a full section of okay. pavement, uh, sub-base material, base material, and obviously paving material. Yep. It's got to support occasional truck traffic uh, because trailers are coming in there. Yep. So that needs to be considered. Yep. Um, plus uh, water quality and, and drainage is going to be, be a big issue Huge. with the regulatory agencies. So, so it's government bureaucracy basically that makes it more expensive? No, it's 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 regulatory okay, that's requirements. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sean, you got it, Sean. If you just think about it, if you look at that picture there, you create you create a a football field of you know a Im impermeable membrane that is you know from the wet the west to the east, it slopes down. It's just you know, you put a good rainstorm, that just that's all down to that wetland. So that's gonna be massive engineering to ameliorate that issue. Fair enough. There's um, also going to be a, a constraint on scheduling this because it's not, uh, we don't have the luxury of the whole construction season. Yeah. We'll, we will severely impact uh, the pack events if in fact that's the case, you know, if, if, if we did not uh, impact them. So we need to do it kind of on an accelerated basis. Yeah. Um, that'll, there's a, probably a bit of a premium on that. Basically March and April or November, right? I was going to say, or the fall, maybe. Oh, after, yeah. basically after Chili Fest, right? So. Yeah, all, all less than ideal times of the year. But yeah, yeah pretty much a spring of 22, we think, is probably when it's going to happen, okay. if it's funded. And again, I, I fully admit that was a stupid question because I wasn't appreciating it, but thank you for educating me, guys. And if we can bring it in for less, certainly we will. No, I know you would. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Jeff, thank you so much for your help with that. Um, and now we're at the end here, uh, the proposed service restoration. We've already talked about this a little bit. Um, you saw this last year um, in, your, uh, in our presentation last year. Uh, this is the Parks and Facility Maintenance Technician um, showing you the current salary and benefits with a negotiated contract where it would slot in. Um, our staffing was previously reduced um, and the master plan has noted that we, have, we would need two to three additional parks and maintenance staff members uh, to get back to what we should have based on comparable communities and comparable level of um, facilities. I, I don't know what more I could say about this at, the, at this point. Um, you, know we, you know we need staff. Uh, this is what we've identified as the best resource to us. Um, Orlando, do you want to add anything here? Now, you know, Tom, we pretty much covered it earlier somewhat, and there might be some more discussion on this later on, but, yeah. you know, we're just trying to kind of make things uh, whole again uh, based on the last, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years of staff reductions. But or, I'm or, sure that th there'll be other discussions on this going forward. Orlando, can you be, be I'd actually want to cover it now if you don't mind, just education sure, wise. Um, so the, the title is Parks and Facility Maintenance Technician. Um, uh, currently, how many of those titled positions, uh, FTs, do you have? We, we don't have any, uh, Chris. This one here is a more of a specialized position. This this will be someone with like a, a two-year trade school, uh, possible three to five years experience in, in, in building uh, maintenance with, with pumps, uh, irrigation systems, uh, electrical, carpentry, someone with those skills. We're finding that we're spending a lot of time, myself and the products foreman, making these repairs uh, currently okay. uh, with, with the pool pumps, uh, uh, ice rink, uh, um, irrigation systems, a lot of our time, probably 60% of it, 
uh, most solar products from it is, is being spent on these repair jobs. So getting someone with these technical skills, background, that can come in and kind of take this burden a little bit off of us and allow us to do our job, which is, you know, work with staff, work orders, park inspections, projects would, would be extremely helpful for us. But it, it, just to answer your question, this would be the first position titled like this. Okay, so that and I, I, that's exactly where I'm trying to go. And my my ig, just out of just sheer ignorance, and my I'm struggling to 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 describe the efforts and output of your of your associates because I think the majority of majority of again my ignorance when I think of your, your team, I just think I think of uh, a, a number of bodies who, for a lack of a better term, um, you know are or labor and they're laboring to get labor intensive things done lifting cutting pushing that sort of that's far it's far more complex it's far more but it's my ignorance and my inability to describe them so this is this is a level above that because of skills and training correct and that yeah that's correct chris and and, and to answer your question i'm glad you brought that up because uh, most people Think that that's all we do. We you know, we cut grass. We work on baseball right. fields. It's not. They don't realize. They don't realize the, the technical aspect of what we do when it comes to repair work. You know, we have certified uh, pool technicians. We have certified uh, refrigeration technicians. People that are higher level people that they're, they're, they're working with with hazardous materials or ammonia. Say, let's say ammonia. You know, things like that that people don't realize that we do. We also do a lot of carpentry work. We do a lot of yeah. fabrication work. You know, people don't realize that that we do where we're where we're our run department and and very little gets contracted out. We do about eighty five percent of all of our work from the fabrication from beginning to end. Yeah, no, I was I was lucky because just as an aside, um, you know, there's there's a lot of artistry that goes along with what your folks do to a certain extent, and I was lucky because a gentleman who volunteered is. Uh, as an assistant coach of my kids' baseball team last year, is one of your it's one of your A players, and uh, it was a, it was a treat to to get to know him and understand uh, deeper just the, the the contribution and the level of involvement um, that he does and the rest of his teammates do. And I again just completely misunderstood, miscalculated the level of involvement. But to know this, is, I think this is helping us. The fact that this is adding in. So this is adding in technical capabilities potentially that are either not being done correctly right now, not being done at all, or being done by you, which is again then pulling you away from what you're supposed to be doing or Thomas supposed to be doing or somebody else. And it's about efficiencies and that whole chain of a chain of events, right? That correct, correct. And I also want to add, Chris. You know, when we were talking about earlier about positions that were lost over the years, you know, we lost two key positions that were titled Park School Leaders. Right. Those were again were higher, little higher end positions with, with more qualifications, uh, with a lot of time trade school schooling behind it, that were handling some of these jobs that we're trying to get someone to handle now. So by losing those top end positions, that left that gap where someone obviously the work's still there. Someone has to complete these tasks and it fell on the project foreman and myself to pick up, pick up these duties. It's work that has to get done, but the pools have to be ready. The rink has to get ready. You know, so that, that we, we ended up having to pick up these, these, the, the load of work because we, we lost those positions. Thank you. All right. I know we need to move on. Um, Tom and, and Orlando, you guys have been on the hot seat for an hour and a half and I appreciate it. Listen, I don't want you to feel beaten down here. There is absolutely nothing in here that I'm not con I'm convinced we, we don't need. Um, you know, we're talking about replacing equipment that we bought when George Bush the first was president. Um, and I think at the end of the day, this community, and by this community, I mean the six of us um, with input, need to decide, you know, what it is we want to be and what it is we want to do. And if we want nice parks and nice things, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for those things. And if we do, then what, what are we not going to pay for? But I, I think... I, th I think it's it's tough, and I appreciate what you put in front of us here. Yeah, Eric, and we appreciate it too. We we know you guys have some tough decisions to make. We we get it. We know we know we're not the top on the top of the list. We never have been. We don't expect to be there, but but uh, we understand what you guys have a tough decisions to make, and and we appreciate whatever support you guys can give us going forward. 
Thanks. Orlando, and I just want to, so I, I appreciate that you recognize that, but remember, you're not on the bottom of the list either, and you're not forgotten about. Um, you know, you guys touch more square footage in this town than any other department, right? In terms of the woods, the roads, I mean, you guys are everywhere. So your impact and your importance is not lost on us here either. So um, please share that with, with your team, because what you guys do does matter very much to us. Will do, Sean. Thank you. And I, I appreciate to hear that, that we're third on the list and not six or seven on the list. So thank, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see what I'm trying to think. Where else we're supposed to be here? <laughs> <laughs> this is just back up to the, to the maintenance technician that shows all the items that we've added over the years, that the town has added over the years. Um, you, you guys have all, you all live here. You, you've grown up, most of you have grown up here. You know, um, it's different than when you were you were a kid, and we're still we're doing it with less. We're maintaining these maintaining this park and rec facilities in this town with less staffing than we did 15 years ago. So uh, we just wanted to illustrate that once again here. Um, proposed responsibilities. Orlando went over this already. I'm not going to not going to waste your time on it. Um, proposed service restoration and. Right now, most of the departments in town, um, probably as you do at your places of employment, have continuing development uh, staff trainings. There's no budget in the parks division right now for staff trainings or certifications. Our guys do carry or, or should have certifications for playground safety inspectors, uh, aquatic facility operators, certified pool operator, certified ice technician, pesticide applicators licenses are the ones we are carrying right now. We do not have a budget for these things. Uh, so what we're asking for is we hope you will consider $2,500 so we can start doing uh, some of the, getting these guys certified um, once again, keeping up. Hey, Tom, any, yes, any, Tom, Maria, uh, if we, if we do this continue education and we get certification, uh, any givebacks on insurance premiums potentially for risk management? I'll leave that to Maria and Melissa. You know, not necessarily. Just keep that, keep that thought. You might want to explore that. Okay. Yeah. The term is about, we're supposed to, you know, we, we get things from Kerma because of, of training audits, whichever we should look at that. Is there an offset to, are we missing out on some of the stuff? Yep. So you can keep question. moving. Okay. I think I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Um, I just wanted to do a quick pulse check. Um, do we want to take just a five minute stretch break before we turn it over to Tom and Public Works? Yes. Okay. Uh, why don't we come back at uh, 2.15? All right. I'll turn it over to Tom Roy whenever you're ready. Eric, if I could go first, uh, this is Jeff Shea. I'm oh, actually. I'm sorry. Eric, Eric, yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, that. that's right. <laughs> I, I got to follow the schedule. Yeah, I'm the warm up act for Tom Roy. We know how <laughs> good a, a presenter he is. So I'll keep it brief today. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is a, basically a, a brief uh, summary of the engineering department uh, for next ne next fiscal year. Um, in terms of our proposed budget, uh, it's set at $283,811. It's a slight decrease, less than 1% of about uh, $2,479. And it's uh, three positions, two full-time and one part-time for 2.71 budgeted FTEs. Um, in terms of our activities, we're doing the same types of things we usually do, provide technical services to departments that need it. Some have it in-house, some do not. We also you know, interface with uh, various community groups, be it the uh, the uh, Friends of the uh, Flower Bridge or the Veterans Memorial Group or the Performing Arts Center people uh, try to uh, assist with them where we interface on, on those sites. Um, in terms of projects that we're uh, focusing on for the next fiscal year, our Terrafield to Bloomfield multi-use trail is very near completion of uh, design and permitting. We're hoping to get that out to bid in the next 60 days and construction is scheduled to start hopefully this summer. Uh, and will continue into 2022. Um, the project's fully funded right now. Um, uh, we recently got a, a bump in our federal funding uh, because of cost increases. So we're excited to get that one going and completed. Uh, municipal site and safety improvements is a project that's been around for a while. This is where we're going to do improvements on the town hall site. Um, this is actually a two phase project. We do have a second phase in the out years of the capital program. But uh, we're hopeful in the next uh, 60 days to get this out to bid uh, and uh, 
you know, see some improvements uh, completed this summer. Uh, so we're excited to get that going. Performing Arts Center parking improvements, obviously, if that's funded, that's something we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we're working right now on the steep portion of the project that has a higher level of environmental review because it has state funds involved with it. So we've already initiated that. Uh, but if, in fact, the additional funds are uh, approved, we'll uh, kind of marry those two projects into one. Um, Fire Town Road Bridge over Bissell Brook and Barn Door Hills Road Bridge over Bissell Brook is in the final stages of design uh, and acquisition of the appropriate easements for that project. Um, this was uh, basically a 50-50 split of uh, federal funding and town funding. So this is a real good example of leveraging funding. And it's a good investment, I think, in our, our larger infrastructure uh, that you know requires significant amount of dollars. And this will uh, keep these bridges in good condition for the next 20 years. And the last uh, project I just want to talk a little bit about today is the multi-use trail project from Route 10 to Curtis Park. Um, we are, again, very close to getting our permitting, uh, both federal and state, on this project. Uh, it'll be in a holding pattern until uh, the rest of our expected uh, grant funding comes uh, to us, which we're hopeful will be next year, if not the yes. following year. Um, but we'll be in a good position to move this forward, possibly through the federal uh, infrastructure um, programs that are being discussed. This could be considered as a ready-to-go project um, for funding, uh, you know, uh, under our uh, regional uh, planning organization. Next slide, please, Melissa. Um, these are just some of the uh, private projects that we're also involved with. Uh, Mike Glidden, I know, spoke to most of these this morning. Um, you know, we do uh, get involved with these in terms of reviewing the development applications, supporting the projects during construction, completing final inspections, uh, looking at bonding if necessary for the projects. So these are just some of the ones we're involved with, and I think Mike spoke to most of them. Next slide. Um, other department activities we're involved with uh, continue to support the MS4 program, which Tom will speak a bit about today uh, after the, my presentation. Uh, we're always pursuing grant opportunities. Um, the trail projects I spoke about previously are heavily leveraged with grants. So that's really our primary focus. If we can hopefully, you know, leverage town money, spend very little of it if possible to get these kinds of facilities that are much longer lead projects with involvement with state regulatory agencies and uh, it's it's really the way to go and I think we've done a good job of doing that and as Mike spoke about this morning also we have the restudy of the Farmington watershed that will support in terms of you know outreach to the public or providing technical assistance if required and the last thing not on this slide is our excavation permit program which uh, I'll speak to next uh, first, let me give you the budget highlights. My apologies. Um, so we did have a decrease in our full-time salary line. Uh, as you know, we did we are fully um, staffed now. We were uh, we did have a gap at one point. Our project engineering position was vacant for approximately a year or so. So we brought the new uh, position or the new person in at a lower salary range. So we're saving about eighty-two hundred dollars in that line item. We have increased our consultant line item by twenty-five hundred dollars only because we're finding, you know, pretty routinely things come up that we haven't anticipated where there's not project funding uh, to just uh, do minor things like easement mapping, cost estimating, conceptual designs or support, uh, those types of services. Um, so we've increased that line item slightly to 20, by $2,500. Um, and again, excavation permits, we're considering uh, implementing a, uh, a fee for our excavation permit program and that's currently free. Um, we've started looking at this last year with the COVID crisis. We kind of lost momentum on it. Uh, next slide, Melissa, please. Um, again, as I mentioned, we, we're currently not charging for roadway excavation permits. Uh, on average, uh, over the last four years, we've issued about 150 annually. Uh, these involve everything from driveway aprons to emergency repairs, uh, gas service uh, installations, 
and also larger projects like uh, utility replacement projects where there's thousands of feet of gas line and or water lines that are being uh, replaced by the private utility companies. Um, this is a bit of a, a tough program to manage in terms of overseeing this uh, in the field. Um, so the uh, construction inspection costs associated with this are currently not funded uh, as they are with a typical building permit process. Over the last couple of years, we've used a little bit of extra uh, salary funding to uh, hire a private consultant to on a very limited basis kind of assist us with overseeing these restorations of pavement uh, to try to, again, keep our pavement management in really good condition. But it's, uh, it's difficult and there's probably a higher level of service that needs to be provided to thoroughly inspect those cuts in our roadway. Um, and again, as we're staffed now, we really don't have the time to uh, cover that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and again, because of the investment uh, and significant investment in our pavement, um, we don't want it, those assets to be deteriorate uh, prematurely because we're not properly doing the restorations. So this permit fee would allow us to recover some of those inspection costs and that would be, you know, how that actually gets done would be determined at a later date. Next slide, please. Uh, we did do a survey of other towns uh, back in 2020. And, you know, we're the only town that does not charge for these permit fees. So we think it's reasonable to expect to recover some of those administrative costs associated with managing that program. Um, if we did, uh, we were thinking about uh, implementing this uh, at the beginning of the uh, fiscal year in July um, 2021. We did certainly get the word out to everyone if, in fact, you guys were supporting it. Uh, and at some point later in the spring, we provided a little bit more information and, and data about how we would move forward with this program. And based on, again, uh, the permits that we've been issuing, and actually this year was a higher quantity, it was about 200 permits, we anticipate we could collect about $6,000 in permit fees. Next slide. I think that's it. Uh, any questions? So I have a question. If we were to get the revenue, $6,000, um, would you need additional staff though to do this? Well, again, we're, lo we're looking creatively out down the road. And again, we don't have all the answers for you today, Jackie, but again, on a limited basis, we could use that funding at a minimum to hire a consultant to do that inspection for us. And we can strategically uh, deploy them, you know, based on uh, major projects for example, that were going to be, you know, uh, under construction that construction season. And that's kind of how we did it in the past. And we're able to, you know, to cover a good portion of those activities, but not, not thoroughly, not, not to the level that we would like to do. Would you need software? Uh, no, no, actually right now we're, you know, we have our system in place. Um, certainly a software program might help, but um, right now, we're managing it pretty well with the tools that we have. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. I think Tom? Yep. Just to see if we can get this to share. Let me know if you need me, Tom. All right. Well, computer is thinking real hard about doing this right now. All right. I think you guys can all see that, right? We can. Man, way to go on technology. Well, I, um, I think like everybody else, I appreciate the fact I know it's been a long day for all of you. Um, if I can get going here. Um, and, and I think just kind of following on a little bit of what a uh, few of the my counterparts have done. I certainly think I appreciate all your time. I appreciate the time um, that Maria and Melissa and Amy put into this budget. But I also think it's important to give recognition to our 41.35 full-time employees within Public Works and all of the work that they've done this year through the, the challenging year we've had with COVID. Um, overall, just kind of diving into the numbers, um, we're looking at a 2% overall increase in our, our budget. 
Um, if you were to factor out the costs of our salaries for our employees, we're actually looking at a reduction of 1.63% overall. And the only one that really jumps out on this page that at first I think you say, wow, 10% increase for administration. That's because we've moved the MS4 from the highway department to public works administration where I think it's more appropriate. So this year we, we, we've been really busy with managing the rollout of the townwide facilities master plan. Um, really a big project for our department. Um, we've also been working on the um, changes associated with the redevelopment of Mira. We've been looking at the implementation of our sidewalk program. We're in our fourth year of that. Design and construction of the Hot Meadow sidewalk, which is part of the load SIP grant that we're able to uh, apply for and receive. It is unfortunate. We did also apply for the sidewalk grant for the um, Firetown Road project, which we were not successful in. But again, it was really good. Um, effort on behalf of our department. And I hope later on at some point, that'll be a project that we'll be able to bring forward. We resurfaced the section of the Greenway Trail, the section right at Bushy Hill and West Street. Um, we've maintained our compliance with the MS4 stormwater permitting. I think at the uh, last Board of Selectmen meeting, I was impressed that Sean took the time to look through at all of the requirements that we have to uh, report for on that. And of course, we're continuing with our pavement um, preservation work. I'd, I'd argue that we continue to have some of the best roads in the state, but what's really important about that is by maintaining our roads in a good state of repair, it's actually more cost effective over time. A um, couple of things that are not on here this year, we had a FEMA level disaster event with um, Tropical Storm Isaia. I'm practicing quite a while to say that one right. Um, we're actually right now working with Amy in our finance department and with the folks at FEMA to hopefully receive reimbursement. Right now we're targeting somewhere in the neighborhood of a $100,000 claim. Um, so fingers crossed on that one. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Clean Energy Task Force this year. Uh, one of the things that's not in the budget is they'd actually pushed for us to have a consultant energy manager to facilitate some of the energy projects that they're interested in. We did manage the on-bill financed energy um, and lighting retrofit projects that went on at the library town hall. And Tom Taberski mentioned how well they were received at the rink. Um, those projects um, took up a, a, a chunk of our staff time, but they really paid off great dividends in the fact that not only are they saving the town money, but they showcase how effective these programs can be. Um, we've been working very hard with Sherry Callanan and the sustainable team, um, trying to keep our, our, our ratings up on that. Um, we've also been working on intersection and safety improvements. I know we got a lot of attention for the West Mountain and Notch Road um, traffic calming work that we did. Um, the one thing I guess that, that I'd like to highlight when we look at this past year is we've done a lot, but we have absolutely no extra capacity. Um, kind of following on that presentation from Parks and Rec, um, you know, by comparison, Orlando is their superintendent is doing work he shouldn't. I look at both Mark Rustic for our buildings and grounds and Kevin Clemens for our highway department. Um, they are literally doing the day-to-day -day work at times. Um, for the last two years, our highway superintendent, instead of occasionally plowing or helping out with the storm, he is literally out plowing for the duration of the storm. It's great that he puts in that effort, but the problem is when he's doing that, he's not it's not giving him the ability to manage the storm in the same way. It's not giving him the ability to teach some of the younger drivers, some of the skills that they should have. And instead he ends up um, becoming just another worker. Um, but we are, we are always trying to do our best with the resources we have, um, but we are certainly stretched as thin as we can be. Um, some of the highlights, um, we're looking at a little over $100,000 increase in our full-time salaries due to the union contracts that were negotiated. Um, we are gonna have an impact from the minimum wage. We like to hire summer kids um, during the summer months. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that we do not really allow our highway department staff to take any significant vacations during the winter. We literally need every single employee to be available. So they're, they're allowed to take a two or three day vacation, but certainly do not book trips to Disney World if you wanna be a, 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 a employee out here in public works. Um, they all need to be available and on call. So during the summer months, we are certainly busy with all of our construction activities, 
And at the same time, if we can bring in summer kids that can do some of the flagging and some of the heavy lifting and some of the manual labor, it really does add a lot to our workforce. Um, we moved what used to be 27,000, we dropped down to 23,000 for our MS4 work. We're doing a lot of work with ATC, a consultant. They've actually been very helpful in making sure that we're going to be compliant. And our goal with MS4 is to be compliant. I can promise you nobody is going to move to Simsbury because we have the best MS4 program. We understand that fully. Um, at the same time, they've been great and, and we've found a few opportunities to improve what we do in terms of our environmental compliance to make sure that we're not going to be liable for any hazardous waste or other materials not being disposed of properly. So it's really been a good relationship with that vendor. Um, and just as a matter of making sure that we capture the cost for all of the AEDs in the buildings have now been captured in our facilities budget. Jumping right into the CNR projects, um, out at the highway department, we have been and historically have been replacing at least one of our large um, plow trucks each year. Um, this actually is the vehicle that's going to be making its way out of the fleet. Um, as you can see from the pictures, this is the truck that we actually use to pull our large chipper, which we'll discuss in a minute. That middle photo, those wood chips are actually from the inside of the truck and they're coming to the outside of the truck. And if you look to the bottom right, that is a rake that one of the guys shoved from the outside to the inside of the truck. Um, so I know whenever we plow roads, people think that we have nice trucks and they look good, but due to the road salts and some of the um, environmental concerns, no matter how good we maintain these trucks, they just have a hard life. There's nothing more that we can do about it. I love the picture in the upper left. That was actually when we did a snow plow ride along with Cheryl Cook. So she actually had the joy of being in the truck during an absolute raging blizzard um, that happened to be during the day. Um, so the truck that we're replacing is gonna actually be a 1997. The truck that is coming off of our frontline truck is going to be 13 years old. When I started here, we were on a 10 year replacement cycle for these frontline trucks. They're now at a 13 year replacement cycle. And a lot of times what will happen is that truck that leaves frontline service goes into work for the department in a different capacity. Um, so again, going back to this chip truck, any given day we have, the truck is hooked up to our large chipper because especially this year with these windstorms or in the springtime with thunderstorms, any given day we could have the need to call guys in and immediately go out and respond. We have a truck that is ready to go with the chainsaws, the pole saws, the rakes, the cones, everything it needs. So that again, it's a very fast response. Um, it's funny for years, I used to always follow the police. It's interesting to be ahead of them this year. And I used to say, you know, they're, they're 24 hours a day, 365 days a year on staff were available 24, 365. Um, this past year, it was unfortunate, but we had a crew in on Christmas morning. Nobody complains, it's part of the job and they're always ready to do it, but it's a tough job for these guys. Oh boy, we've got a lot of pictures to try and explain this one, but one of the things that's unique is we go out all summer long and we dig up catch basins in preparation for our roadway work. And when we dig up the catch basins, we end up bringing back the material that's shown in the picture on the left. You can see there, if you look closely, concrete catch basin tops, asphalt, gravel, soils, sand, um, and that pile grows. And every two to three years, we have to bring in a crusher, which takes that pile, crushes it up, and turns it into the pile that you see on the right. So as one pile in our yard gets bigger, the other pile gets smaller because all of that material that has been crushed up is used to backfill the construction work that they do all summer long. Uh, up in the far right just gives you a close up view of the, of the gravel that they end up making. That recycled material on average costs us about $4 a cubic yard. If we were to purchase that material, it would be about $12 a cubic yard. We would also have the burdened cost of how do we dispose of all of that wonderful material that we dig up. So it's a really, for, for, for the nerdy engineer in me, it's a super exciting story about how we reuse the products that we dig up in, in a very responsible way. And most importantly, it's financially uh, responsible. A couple of years ago, we switched from just a traditional steel blade at the bottom edge of our plows. Um, what we now use is a um, segmented plow blade. So if you look closely at the picture at the right, the plow basically has one foot long sections that float. And as much as we take care of our roads, they're not perfectly flat. 
They're not perfectly level. They have a little bit of character here in Simsbury. And what happens with this type of plow blade is it allows those individual segments, that one foot spot to go up and down, up and down to follow the contours of the road. What's important about that is it means that we don't end up with a thin layer of snow and slush when we, when we leave. It scrapes it clean, which means we're gonna have better quality roads during our, our winter storm. Some cases we end up using less material because it scrapes away so much cleaner and so much better. And they've also been lasting us very long. Um, when we were using traditional steel blades, more often than not in the middle of a snowstorm, we may actually have to change a cutting edge. Where these for the most part, um, it's a two year, two and a half year, maybe even three year replacement cycle. Uh, so we're looking at $28,000 from our town aid road fund to um, support that replacement. Uh, we talked a little bit before about the West Mountain and Notch Road. This was our traffic calming. This was actually supported by a grant that we received. We actually reallocated the funds. I'm sorry, Sean, from um, one end of town over to this area based upon um, a high level of concern by a number of residents. That was um, the right decision. That That is a very dangerous intersection. I appreciate you understanding on that. Um, I, I, I didn't want to bring out the, the, the videos. I didn't, I didn't trust my computer to show it. But when we set this up, we actually had great cooperation with our fire department and with Salters. Fire department dr um, drove through one of their large trucks and we had the school bus drive through just to make sure it was not going to be an issue. Um, generally speaking, the neighborhood has been super supportive of this. They've been very happy that we not only took the initiative, but they feel the solution is reasonable. And we're looking at $30,000 to make this a permanent solution. And I know somebody right now is about to say, why is it $30,000 to make this permanent? Uh, we wanna do um, a, a basic survey of this area. We would like to um, spend a few thousand dollars to have engineering services to make sure from a liability standpoint that we're covered. And we also wanna make sure that the final product looks a little bit more attractive than um, yellow and orange cones. So it would probably be granite curbing for that center island, just in case it was to, to get hit, it would hold up and look better. Uh, and then on the left side where the orange cones are, it would be traditional bituminous curb, some grass and some landscaping. Um, so kind of an exciting project as we're starting to get into traffic calming and Again, as an engineer, it's great when you suddenly say, instead of trying to get cars through an area as fast as possible, we're respecting the fact that people live there. This is part of somebody's home. This is part of their neighborhood. And sometimes going a little slower in the car makes everybody's life a little bit better. Um, okay, a dumb question. Fire away. We're doing that a lot today. But is, was there any consideration to just shutting it off? There was. There was consideration. Another way to get there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we looked at several options. We looked at shutting it off. I have to be honest, a rotary was considered, um, a T intersection was considered, um, but based upon, and I kind of like the way we did this with a, a try before we buy approach. Yeah. Um, it seems to have done well. It doesn't sound amazing, but the average vehicle speed was slow, was reduced by about three or four miles an hour, which again, not huge, but it shows not just a, um, a feeling by the residents, but we actually have some data that says, yes, on average cars did go slower through there. Now it's a change in behavior and that could be the difference of, of an accident or not right there, right? So that, that, I mean, yeah, when you break it down, I mean, into a percentage of speed, if, if we had a, a speed before of just under 40 and now you drop it on closer to 35, that's a big difference. Yep. Big difference. yep. That's a lot of stopping feet. Yeah, I agree. I also think it's safer as you're pulling out onto West Mountain, making a left-hand turn. You can see a lot better. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, so yeah, that one's that one's a really exciting project for me. Um, we have our highway superintendent, frontline vehicle, um, and one of the things you'll hear as as I talk about vehicles and vehicle replacements. We, we have a lot of equipment and we have frontline equipment. And the difference is the frontline equipment is out there during the snowstorms. It's out there during the tropical storms. It has to work. Um, when one of our frontline plows goes down, not only is that plow out of service, we also have a mechanic now who that is their primary function. One plow goes down, we're okay. You have a storm where you have two plows or possibly in worst case, three plows go down. All of a sudden our ability to keep the roads open and passable drops quickly. And with that, now we have the, the threat that the fire department, the police department and the ambulance cannot move around town efficiently. Um, we, we had a blizzard back in, just shy of a blizzard back in um, 
middle of December, we were getting three plus inches an hour of snow. And if now all of a sudden, if you can imagine two or three trucks coming off the road, it's just not an acceptable situation. By comparison, in our buildings and grounds department, we do not consider those plow trucks, frontline plow trucks. So their replacement cycle, instead of being seven years, is 10 years. If one of those goes down and the town hall parking lot doesn't meet the level of service we need, it's not an immediate health and safety crisis for us. Uh, this is the second of our, our large pickup trucks. This is a typical truck that's driven by one of our crew leaders. Um, it's a Ford F-350 or F-450, has a 10-foot plow on it, dual wheel, salter. Um, and again, this is a workhorse during the storm. This is the um, type of vehicle that when we do have an emergency situation, when there is a medical call, these are the trucks that divert, clear the road. We don't wait for the ambulance to call us. They're listening and monitoring the scanner. And this is the truck that's clearing the way. This is also the crew leaders are the ones that get the phone call for the tree that falls in the middle of the night. They show up with this truck. It has barricades. It has cones. It has a chainsaw. And nine out of 10 times, we have some really good crew leaders and they'll take care of the situation on their own. We have... Um, there's actually a great picture down on the right. This is the actual 2001 front end loader with what's called a four in one bucket, which allows the, the loader to pick up a log. This is from last week's windstorm. We, we actually had to, I had to call Len in the front office and have her swap out the photo because we'd gotten a new photo of this one. Um, again, this is a critical piece of equipment during this type of thing. At 2001, you're looking at 20 years old, um, it, it, it's a, a critical piece for what we do. This is also the, the equipment that during tropical storms, this piece of equipment operates right up until we're at a critical point where we feel it's no longer safe to be out there. And we rely on this to protect our staff as well. Um, during heavy, heavy um, windstorms, the guys go out there, as long as power lines are not involved, they take this equipment, they get the road open. They'll put it on, on the side of the road. Sadly, it's more often not in somebody's front yard. And we'll come back when the winds die down to clean up the mess. But this is what gets the roads open. It's what keeps the roads open. Uh, during large, large winter storms, we would be able to have, we have three loaders. One would be in the north end of town. One would be in the south. And one would be at the shop loading the salt. Um, you don't realize it, but our large plow trucks are not four-wheel drive. And during a big enough snowstorm, they can actually get stuck, and it's these loaders that pull them out. Um, we talked earlier about the chip truck. At the back of the chip truck, you can see in the in the bottom left-hand corner, that is our large wood chipper. Um, it was from 2012. Um, we have two whipped wood chippers. This is a large one. It is a wonderful piece of equipment, and you can see it's actually operated by a grapple. Um, wood chipper is a nasty nasty machine. And when we go out, we're not felling trees. We are dealing with what you see in the upper right hand corner, where it's a mangled bunch of twisted wood. And with the grapple, we're able to load it in and keep the guys safe. They, they stay away from the back end of the machine. And you can see on this one, when they're operating the grapple, um, just to the right of the machine, you see like little clear plastic and two little handles. They are actually operating it from behind that um, shield so that they're safe. Um, th I, I can tell you when we had our um, 2011 um, disaster with Winter Storm Alfred, um, we did not have this piece of equipment. Um, and I can tell you the guys who came up to help us clean it up, guy from Texas, Derek Tucker, he said, Mr. Raw, y'all live in a forest up here. And we do. And this is the type of equipment that we need to, uh, to keep the road safe. Um, I think you told that story in 12 when you told us we had to buy this thing for the first time. It was one of the first <laughs> pieces of capital I was around for. <laughs> you know what was so sad? I think, I think I may have made some crack about, you know, when we have, you know, this disastrous um, hurricane, we're going to need this. And then it happens. So I don't joke around like that anymore, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you for a while there. I think you were the uh, you were the voodoo doll there for all the weather that was happening, buddy. It was uh, or the cause of it. It was uh, it was a rough span we had, but yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of this stuff has unfortunately gotten a lot of exercise over the last decade, right? I I tell you what, I wish I wish we didn't have any good stories to tell. Uh, yeah, you've got a few, right? <laughs> a few too many, and, and this year's been uh, fairly active. Knock on wood. Yeah. Um, our, our your point is right, though, and, and sorry to interrupt, Tom, but it's, you know, again, 
I, I think that's lost on folks. I mean, we do live in a forest and right. How many times do we hear from the linemen that come in from Canada or come in from the Midwest or the South? And they look at us like we're crazy because there are trees all over um, our, our lines. Right. And in the, in other places, they don't have this, either the lines are buried or they don't have the tree canopies that we do. So it comes, it comes with the cost of uh, comes with the cost of the community. Right. And that we, we enjoy our canopies, but you know, we have to, we have to invest in this stuff. Exactly right. It, it, it's it's a, a beautiful thing and it's a beautiful community, but it, there there is a challenge. That chipper also did an enormous job over the last three years with our ash tree problem. A lot of times we would work with our contractor. The contractor brings the tree down. We would use our chipper and our ground crew to do the heavy work. We would let them work up in the canopy with their bucket truck doing the dangerous work. And it was just a great way of being very cost effective and, 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 and getting the job done. So, um, Yes, absolute ton of tree work. Um, you mentioned it earlier, but we're looking at $1.2 million um, to pave roughly 10 miles of road. The 10 miles of road each and every year keeps our average uh, or, or keeps us on a 17 year resurfacing um, schedule. The 17 years is about how long a um, resurfaced roadway is going to last, assuming we do some basic maintenance in the middle, some crack sealing and that type of thing. Um, it used to actually be longer. Um, pavements today, because of, of some environmental regulations, don't quite hold up as long. Um, we, we've had generally really good success. I think our roadway program is really the envy of a lot of our, our, our neighboring communities, and we put a lot of work into it. We do not have one size fits all when it comes to resurfacing a roadway. We still use probably seven or eight different techniques based upon the condition of the roadway, the traffic that it sees, um, what type of neighborhood it's in. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Clemens in our office is, is right in there with, with every single paving job, making sure that it goes well. And, um, it's a, it's a big operation every year. Um, speaking of which we just, um, a couple years ago, picked up, um, sidewalk replacement. This has been a really big initiative for our office. Um, you can see in the top right, that's actually a sidewalk in Terraville that's scheduled to be redone this coming summer. We have preliminary designs done right now. We've been doing all of the sidewalk design and oversight using in-house staff within Public Works. Uh, it's been a, you know, again, it's been a huge initiative. You can see on the bottom right, that's a section along Firetown Road. I believe that's right near um, Henry James. You see now that it has an ADA tactile warning strip and ADA compliant ramp huge part of our sidewalk program is making sure that we are going to be ADA compliant so we're accessible to those in wheelchair chairs and with mobility impairments. That's important because not only is it the right thing to do, it's also protecting us against potential liability. Um, not that we're not doing the right thing, but it also has that other component to it where there have been communities that have actually ended up in court for not having an ADA transition plan for their sidewalks. Ah. As Jeff mentioned, uh, the Lotset project that he's been working on for the bike trail connecting to Terraville. This is our Lotset project where we're getting an $810,000 grant um, to bring a sidewalk essentially from Hoskins all the way up to the DOT maintenance facility uh, along Hot Meadow Street. It's also going to have a section going into Dorset Crossing. I think it's, we're just about ready to roll it out and do a meeting with the North End businesses so that they'll know this is coming. Um, we've had so far support. I know Steve Antonio in particular has gotten everybody's attention when we were putting the grant in for this. Project is going along um, very well right now. We just uh, yesterday received comments back from the state. Slim chance it could be ready for construction late fall of this year. If not, it would be spring of next year. Our original target was spring of next year. So it's actually trending a little bit ahead of schedule right now. Okay. Before I just take a pit, little pause before I shift gears and go into the WPCA. I don't know if you want to hit me with questions on, on the normal public works budget before we go into the much easier WPCA budget. Yeah, why don't I we get start with public works? Uh, <laughs> Jackie, were you going to jump in? I just had a question on paving. Do you want me to wait, Eric? No, go ahead. Okay. And just really quickly, I just want to say thank you, Tom, for everything you've done this past year, putting your guys in tents for COVID. <laughs> so they were all still active and on the road and the wind storms you talked about and the snow storms. So just thank you so much for all of your work. Well, thank you, Jackie. I was going to say, I don't have a consistency <laughs> group, but I got you. I got you. So <laughs> um, paving, 
I think I just wanted to check, is Eno in this year's paving? That that's Eno would fall in under capital. It would not fall in under um, this portion of the paving. So I don't know, Marie, okay. if you want to talk to where that is or. Yes, yeah. So um, we don't have the Eno paving and the upcoming budget. Um, okay. And we are hoping um, to pair that in an out year. Um, we have an interest in applying for a steep grant um, to convert Station Street from one way to two way um, and to do some, um, some sidewalk work, um, parking work in general. So we'd really like to hopefully pair um, those two projects together. And it's also part of a larger accessibility project that we've been saving up money um, with our Belden Trust money um, to, to do some work on accessibility improvement. So um, there's sort of a, a handful of you know, projects that, that we're hoping to do uh, in an upcoming year. Um, I'd okay. have to double check. I think it's year two of the six-year plan or three. Um, but I think it might be year two. I just have to It's year two for that year one. Two. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Yeah. Would that also be um, Station Street? working to get that to be two-way is that exactly okay. that's, that's, that's why i was asking hope. about you know okay. yes yeah that's the hope you know I, I think that would be a really good candidate for a steep grant oh, um there have been so many studies over the years right i mean i think it was it's too bad mike is on the call right now but you know especially in the 1960s there was a big movement to convert streets to one way and since then there have just been so many studies that have shown in terms of economic development you know one yep. streets um, really hinder economic development and we'd love to um it, it, it's narrow but we'd love to try and and convert that back to a two-way street which would require um quite quite a bit of work um, but again we think that's a really good candidate for a potential steep grant and if we're doing that work we'd like to also do the parking lot work at that time because it's exactly. just sort of all connected you know yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you so much and i'm sorry thank you oh, Tom. Great question. I, I, I great question. It's better to get the questions in before we kind of <laughs> switch gears i have a question too you can drive down that street two way, can't you? You just gotta have a big enough truck. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, Wendy, go ahead. That's okay. So um Town Aid Road, I I just curious, like what's the stipulation for when we use that? For instance, the traffic calming notch road. There it's coming out of the general fund. Is there um certain things you can or can't use for Town Aid Road? Is there not enough in the fund balance to use it for um, a project like that? What distinguishes when you use it and when you don't for that type of project? Sure, maybe I'll start, Tom, and then have you jump in if that's all right. Um, so you're, you're exactly right, Wendy. So Town Aid Road does come with a number of stipulations, and there are certain things that we can um, use it for. So some, for examples, um, we can use it for, um, for repaving roads. We can use it for our plow blades. Um, we can use it for certain public works equipment that support the maintenance of our roads. Um, we can use it um, for um, uh, purchasing salt and treatment um, for the roads. So there are a number of um, expenses that we can charge to Tiny Road, but there are also a number of expenses that we can't charge. Um, I don't believe the traffic common would be eligible under Town Aid Road. Would you Would you agree, Tom? I I, I think it would be a stretch. It probably wouldn't be worth um, worrying about it because we could always offset the cost by buying something else that was already clearly eligible. Um, I think the big the big thing kind of with the history of Town Aid Road is um, for decades, long before I came here, it was only used for highway construction equipment. And a few years ago, and partly because sometimes I'm a little too frugal, we really were nervous that it was going to get cut, that it was just going to flat out end. Um, and there was a lot of talk about that. So we really used it um, less and less, or we deferred a lot of our um, equipment. Sean probably remembers for years, we deferred um, the large street sweeper, which was you know just under 300,000, know, big ticket item. And we held off, we held off, we held off. But um, it, now it, it allowed us to get that fund up high enough that we've actually been using it the last couple of years to support the roadway paving, which is relatively new, I'd say within the last three to four years. Um, so again, it's a balance. It, it's a fund that the town has the ability to use. It's offsetting um, our paving work that we need to invest in. And it's just a question of, you know, what bucket you put so something in, but it's still a finite dollar value. But is there, a, is there I guess, is there, a, um, you know, a, a good balance in there? I, I'm just, you know, like, you know, the, the vehicles, I don't know if they normally come out of the general fund. Some of them have trade in value, but if they're highway related and there was funds in Town Aid Road, it wouldn't have to go against the general fund and, you know, um, come out of the public 
So I just was curious on sure I how we maybe, stand for Town Aid Road, I guess. Yeah, sure. I can maybe start off and ask Tom to, to add in as well. So, you know, generally we are trying to keep a fund balance in there of about four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, typically we're getting on the upper end of and I'm just rounding about three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a year from the state for that. So as Tom said, and it hasn't happened recently, but a number of years back, there was some concern and some volatility in terms of whether or not the state was going to continue to fund the program. It seems like that has maybe fallen by the wayside at the moment, but given that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were leaving at least one year's allocation in there, right? Maybe even a little bit of cushion. So if the state were to just abruptly take that funding away, it gives us a little bit of time to start coming up with a contingency plan and figuring out how we're gonna pay for some of those items that we've been traditionally paying for. Um, so, you know, there's always sort of a plan within a plan and Tom does a really nice job of this. And, you know, we've carefully, you know, laid out, um, you know, with what we anticipate for revenues versus wanting to keep that fund balance sort of in, you know, in a spot. Um, but I would definitely say that there's not, you know, a significant, if you will, cushion beyond um, what we're anticipating for that, that fund balance. Um, Tom, is there anything you wanted to add for how we no, measure I, with that? No, I, th I think you kind of hit the nail on the head is that, that we're, we're keeping about a year's um, revenue in there as a balance. But at the same time, this year, for a short time, we, we talked about whether or not we could even afford the front end loader, which was actually deferred. It was supposed to have been replaced last year. And, and you know, I, again, um, within Public Works, I think I think we try to do as much as we can with as little as possible. Um, but these big pieces of equipment are just they're expensive, um, but they need. It's similar to I think when you look at the fire department when they buy a new apparatus, it's it's shocking how much money it is. But there's no skimping on it. When you need a fire truck, you need a fire truck of a certain size. Um, our front end loaders are a little bit smaller than we, what we bought ten years ago, but they're the bare minimum size to do the job that we need them to do. Okay, for now. Mm, okay. Are there other questions before we go to WPCA? Um, Eric, real quick, uh, I want to commend Tom and his folks, both when we have a crisis and even when we just have a regular snowstorm, uh, your, your guys and gals uh, step up and uh, have gotten us through this COVID world in good shape. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. All right, on to WPCA. And I always say that it's um, a little bit easier because of this very first uh, bullet here, which is WPCA is effectively a utility. Um, it's operated by the town, but every single dollar that's spent at the WPCA is from user fees. We're sitting at about 4,700 give or take customers right now. And, and they're the ones that are supporting um, the operating budget. Simsbury's portion, um, just under 1.8 million. The remainder is being paid by um, Granby and Avon. Uh, we accept flows from both Granby and Avon at our facility. Uh, we're looking at capital costs, and I'm gonna speak just to the Simsbury's portion at just over a million dollars this year, and we're gonna go through some of the, those capital expenditures. Um, there is a, an awful mistake on this slide. Um, the debt service is no longer 1.2 million and 855 uh, for Simsbury because we have refinanced our loan um, that number is closer to 873,000 total and just under 600,000 um, for the town of Simsbury. So really, really great work by um, Amy and, and Maria and Melissa on, on getting that done. Um, that's also gonna benefit both Granby and Avon. Um, I think we should ask uh, Brandon to send us a nice thank you note. Um, one, one key thing, I think, before we go much farther when we talk about the finances for the WPCA, um, it's a very well-run organization in terms of um, financial capacity and what they're doing. And what's important is our fees are at average or lower than fees throughout the region and throughout the state. We're at about $360 for a residential home. And that's the cost that we, we, we care the most about is, is how do we provide this service that allows for good economic development? How do we um, make it affordable for a family to, to have their wastewater disposed of properly? Um, and I know everybody likes to go WPCA and there's kind of a little hesitancy because, you know, the thought is muted. <laughs> um, so um, the Tungsis, um pump station, um, what that does is everything in the sewer system flows downhill by gravity. 
some areas in town can't be served without pumping the water back up to get them over the ridge. So we have pump stations. And when the pump station is moving the wastewater up, it's going through a force main. The force main in Tungsis is wearing out because of the velocity and the fact that the water um, being pumped has a level of grit. Um, and instead of digging up that whole section of pipe, we're actually going to line it with trenchless technology. So a fraction of the cost, uh, we're looking at $50,000 to replace 1,300 feet of um, force main. So really a great project there. Um, typical of everywhere else, we have a truck, which it's time to replace. Um, they're going to be replacing this Ford F-150 with an F-250. This Ford F-150 is going to go and service our custodial department that was in line for a new vehicle replacement this year that I think we had budgeted at 30 or 35,000. Now that cost is off the table and they're going to utilize this vehicle. Um, this um, top bullet is just showing a little bit of this trenchless um, technology. I know we talked about it last year. Um, we did a lot of this relining work this past summer in Tariffville. It is amazing in terms of its effectiveness. Um, if we have older infrastructure, older pipe in the ground, groundwater can seep into old joints and get into the sanitary sewer. Not the end of the world, but what happens now is that clean groundwater goes into the sanitary sewer and it goes to our treatment plant and we spend money to treat it because it gets mixed in with everything else. Um, by lining the sewers, we are making a structural liner so the pipe is gonna last at least another 50 years and we're keeping the dirty water in, we're keeping the clean water out, and we are reducing our overall operating costs. Um, we, we lined um, half a million dollars worth of pipes last summer. I don't think, I don't think we got more than one phone call. Um, company did a great job. I'm hoping we can actually use the same contractor again this summer. And again, it's one of those, it's like crack sealing the roads. It's not exciting, but it's the best money we spend at reducing our overall costs. Um, Sean, you're going to yell at me on this one, but this is the berm improvement around the plant. Because the treatment plant is in a flood zone, because it has to be near the river, the, um, the plant is surrounded by a berm. We could call it a dam. And it's intended that in a 100-year flood, or in this case, even a 500-year flood, we have to make sure that the Farmington River does not infiltrate our plant. Because as soon as that happened, the plant no longer works, and all of that contaminated water is going to make it into the Farmington River. Um, nothing has changed with our berm. However, FEMA has reevaluated the flood potential in the area and has raised a 100-year flood two feet. So we're working with um, FEMA on the um, BRIC grant to see if they will pay um, the bulk of the cost of raising the berm two to three feet. Um, we're looking at three feet as a possibility because that would actually get us into the 500-year um, floodplain. We are only going to do this project. And stress again, we're only going to do this project if we receive the grant funding. If not, we will continue to look at it for years and years. Um, it is expensive because we would be removing all of those trees, all of the fencing, bringing in hundreds and hundreds of cubic yards of fill. Um, there would be a concrete core because, again, it's a dam. It needs to hold back the water. And there would also be some improvements to the entryway. So go ahead and yell at me now, Sean. No, it's just, I get it. I mean, it's a strict government requirement that it has to be gold plated dirt mm -hmm. as part of, you know, part of this, right? It, or does it have to have trace diamond material in it? Is, you know, it's gold plated, but as long as it's certified gold plated. <laughs> just giving you a hard time, buddy. <laughs> it's one of those, but it's, it's, it's one of those things, right? It's, this is the part that nobody likes to talk about, but it's dams and berms and these things that we have to do to protect critical infrastructure, right? Because it's catastrophic. And in every sense of the word, if that berm is breached, right? Yeah. And, and believe me, I, um, you, you'd be happy. I beat up on our consultant pretty good about, you know, what if, could we, how about, and again, because the likelihood of this is fairly low, could we have a plan in place where we could put up a temporary, um, th there are um, portable dams. They, they're basically giant fire hoses that could be deployed for certain situations. We said, could we put this on top of our existing berm to get us that two to three extra feet? Could we actually have a program to sandbag? And every coulda, woulda, shoulda, there was a reason why it wouldn't work. And it was a justifiable, well thought out answer. So no, and that's, that's the right answer. We shouldn't skimp on stuff like this, right? But we should, and you've done the, we have to exhaust all possibilities. And the answer is what it is, right? So no, I appreciate that level of analysis, Tom. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and we're hoping, and I believe we're going to end up with the grant. So, um, 
The, the next one, and again, it, it shows up as a capital project, but it's actually not going to cost the town any money. Um, currently, when EB built a lot of the housing that EB built, um, they built their own sewers. And I've talked to many of folks at e EB and Dino, and I said they were really good at making things blow up. They were terrible at building sewers. Um, so for decades, the people who have lived in these um, homes have been responsible for maintaining and owning a sanitary sewer collection system. Um, nobody wants to do that other than Tony Piazza. Nobody should be doing that other than our WPCA folks. So what we've done is we're working with, with the folks at Dino Nobel to completely replace um, all of the sewers serving those um, homes up in that area with a sewer system that will meet current codes. As soon as it meets current codes, the WPCA will take over the maintenance and operation of that facility. Um, Dino has been a great partner in this, and we're also looking as part of this project to reline um, some of the sanitary sewers within their facility, uh, replace some of the sanitary sewers in their facilities, um, make them run in straight and reasonable and logical paths like they probably should have always. Um, and then we will also, as we do this, we'll be repaving the road and looking at some drainage improvements as well. So, okay, with that, any more questions? Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Oh, Tom, can I just have you quickly just remind folks of the really, um, <laughs> the really neat uh, award that WPCA is up for and remind people to vote? Oh, we're looking at, at we, we're looking at a Leslie Nope Infrastructure Award, I believe is what it, it came down to. And I know we've uh, put it out on our Facebook page and it, it's basically looking at um, a lot of what happens within the WPCA world. And it, it's broken down into a bracket system, kind of a March Madness thing. Um, sadly, right now though, we are up against an aquarium. Really tough competition. So if you get the chance to vote before Monday morning, it would really help us. It would be exciting if we could uh, make it to the next round. But again, I know it's tough going against an aquarium. That is tough. <laughs> I Thank did you vote. for bringing this opportunity to our residents. We, we need this. Well, and I think it's great for the WPCA folks, because like I said, I don't think um, a lot of people appreciate what they really do to protect the river um, and the work they do. And it's something I hope they're all proud of. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank you. We're going to cover residential rental property. Did you want to cover that, Maria, or did you want me to do that one? You know, um, I don't know if folks just have general questions on it. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing yeah. out of the ordinary there. Um, but if people have questions, we're ha happy to take them. Uh, what was that about? The residential <laughs> the, uh... um, rental property fund. So for the half a dozen or so low income units that we own, it's where the rent comes in. And then we use that money to do improvements and, and things of that nature on, on the property. Tab 23. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to see if folks would like to take a 10 minute stretch before going to the police budget or if we wanted to keep rolling through. Yeah, let's take, let's take five or so. I need caffeine. All right. Why don't we come back at 320? Okay. Eight. Beautiful. All right. Do it. Maria, just quick. Do we have an end time or do we go till we're done? You know, we ballparked, yeah, yeah. yeah, we we, <laughs> we ballparked four o'clock, but in some years, if folks are still, you know, feeling like they want to go a little longer, sometimes we've gone as late. I want to say it's maybe four thirty, quarter of five. So I just think maybe we could be flexible depending on how I, folks are feeling. I'll have to I'll have to go to audio only if we go past four, just because of another obligation. But you know, let's just keep moving now. For me. And then, but then the rest of like, there's a lot of conversation that will happen. Do when do we do that? Is that Monday? So that will be on Monday evening. Um, and okay. if we need a second night, what we've typically done um, is usually done that on Wednesday or Thursday of the same week. So okay. um, you know, just based on sort of the pace of where we're at, we'll probably need a second meeting this coming week. So um, before we break for the you know official end of the day, we might want to eyeball and see maybe which which evening Wednesday or Thursday might work better for for the majority yeah. of the group. Okay, thanks. I didn't. I'm going to want to be fresh for for those more interesting conversations. You're going to be want to be what? I want to be fresh. I'm going to be fresh. too tired. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll say, "Look, just give them what they want, and we'll walk yeah, away." And sleep on it too. Yes. All right. I'll see you in okay. a few. <laughs>